We learn more by looking for the answer to a question and not finding it than we do from learning the answer itself. And that is 100% true. Like students don't like struggling, don't like finding answers, but if you, if you can't find an answer, or let's say you get a test question wrong, and then you go figure out why it was wrong, you're way more likely to remember it. So I, so I have students sometimes take like practice quizzes before they even learn anything. They're gonna do terrible on it, but then when they see that topic come up, let's say they missed a question about reticular tissue, something I talk about today, it doesn't really matter. When I'm talking about reticular tissue in class, when they get to it in their resources, their ears are gonna perk up, they're gonna pay better attention, and they're actually gonna learn it. So, so failing before you learn something can help you learn it, failing while you learn something can help you learn it, and failing after can help you learn it. So I want an example from my life is I can only remember two questions that I've ever been tested on. And there was a question when I was a student here in 1996 about cottage industries in my Western Civilization class. And I took a girl's anatomy final where you walk around a table full of cadavers and, they, and you have little pins putting, pushed in things and what's this? And it's the esophagus. And the reason I remember those two questions is because I missed them. I'm not saying they're the only two questions I ever missed, but um, they were questions that I missed and I figured out why I missed them and they've stuck in my head. So this idea of trying to figure out that was the esophagus, it was just a total like kind of a brain fart. I was just looking at like, what is this thing? And then, then when I figured it out, it was one of these moments and I'll never forget it. So and the same thing with the cottage industry, that's not even in my field. And I still remember that question because I missed it. I don't remember questions I got right. I, I remember questions that I looked for the answer and couldn't find it. Then when I did find it, remember we, um, the, the worst mistakes are the ones you don't fix. So figuring out why I missed those questions stuck that to my brain in a way that getting a question right never could. All right, so this is, with, it's easy to make yourself think you know anything. You can make yourself think you're an expert at anything. And the key with that is to study it, at a, learn it at a real passive surface level where you recognize the information. So a student doing this would actually be like, I read through my notes 10 times and I highlighted every time and, and I recognized all the words on the page. I know this. Or I've been through the textbook six times, I recognize all the words and I know this. I've gone through my Quizlet or my flashcards, right? I went through my flashcards, I, I looked at the question, I looked it over, yeah, I know that answer, right? These are, these are all ways that you can convince yourself that you know anything. But if you actually are testing yourself using retrieval practice, you'll know very early what you know and what you don't know. And that's a very powerful tool. Knowing what you know is important, knowing what you don't know is important. Because if you know what you don't know, you know where to spend your time learning. If you already know something, you spend less and less time on it. And I'll, and I'll give you the best technique for that in just a few moments. Practice pulling information out of your head. That what they actually use in the literature is they say you interrupt, interrupt the curve of forgetting. So you learn things and there's a forgetting curve where we learn, uh, we, most of the stuff we forget, most of the things you're gonna learn today, you're gonna forget tonight, right? So there's this forgetting curve, and then it just gradually moves forward. The longer it's been since you learned something, the more likely it is you no longer remember it. That's the forgetting curve. Retrieval practice interrupts the forgetting curve. So you actually want to start to lose some information and then suck it back in, pull it back in. That'll actually strengthen connections in ways of just repeating information never would. So that's what I mean by forgetting helps you remember. You're actually forming these hooks that you can hang new information on. This is gonna be very hard in the beginning because you don't have a lot of hooks. So like everything else, like exercise, the, the more you do it, the better you're gonna get at it. Well, the same thing with these kind of learning techniques. So why don't we wanna do it? These things are very hard. Students love it. Students feel really productive when they sit down and they have a study session where they feel really good about themselves. They, were, they recognize the material, they're very familiar with the material, and they feel awesome about themselves. Then they sit down and take a test and they feel terrible because they realize they actually didn't know anything. So that's what I meant about like if learning's easy, you're doing it wrong. You want, you want to look like her when you're done studying, but then when you take your exams, you want to actually know the material. So it, the, the crazy thing is they've actually done research where they teach they teach students different methods, different study methods. They have them use them. They prove to them that retrieval practice is number one, space repetition is number two, and using it better, together is even better. And then when they, when they ask the students what they thought worked better, even though you can clearly show them the data that these techniques work better, they will say rereading and all these passive things because um, they, they equate ease with quality. 
So the main reason students don't do these things, even though they know they work, now they may not have been told about them, but if you've heard about these techniques and still don't use them, it's because it's hard and we don't like things to be super hard. So, um, so I want, as a teacher, this sounds terrible, I want you to feel bad about your progress. I want every study session to hurt which, because that's where the, how the learning happens. Your brain is like, it's, your brain is like, I'm not gonna let this get me. Like, I'm gonna figure this out. The fact that you struggle through it makes it more likely that you're going to remember it. So you want every session to be painful. Now there's, um, there's good, there's good. That's so, so, so for this to happen, we have to overcome procrastination. We can't use space repetition if we procrastinate, can we? We have to learn how to focus. Because the enemy number two, we'll cover procrastination and distraction next week. Enemy number two of learning is distraction. Because procrastination, you don't study at all. Distraction is you sit down to study and you think about everything but the material. So those are two huge enemies that we have to overcome. But you have to get used to being frustrated. And this is a good kind of frustration. So there's like learning things that are just 10 steps above where you're at that never makes any sense either. You want to stretch your mind a little bit, right? So I'm, I'm, my son's four. We're not going to be practicing calculus problems because it's going to help him learn. It would be way, you know, way above and beyond. But when you're four, can you start working on things that five-year-olds would work on and stretch your mind, right? Can we, can we start um, interleaving where instead of just giving um, a page where you only work on addition, well, maybe they'll start sprinkling in some subtraction. Can we do little things like that to make your learning a little more difficult? So you want to stretch yourself, but you don't want to snap. So you want to be a little bit frustrated. You want to be a level of frustration that you can overcome. Not this stuff is so far over my head, it's, that's not going to help you. So that's what I mean by getting over or getting used to being frustrated, like just a little bit frustrated. So I don't, I don't want my students feeling terrible about themselves, but I want them to feel like the study session hurt a little bit and it was hard and it did stretch their mind, right? You overwork your muscles a little bit, you're gonna get a little bit of an ache. I kind of want that kind of that brain ache too because the beauty of stretching your mind when you actually, your mind grows and changes because of what you're learning, it'll never be the same again. Like you truly might not be able to do something today, right? When someone says, I can't do it, the key there is you can't do it now or you can't do it yet because you might not be able to do it yet. But, you, but thankfully, your brain is going to change and you're going to be different tomorrow than you were today and you're going to be different the next day than you were that day, right? So this I can't thing doesn't work, doesn't fly at my house either. I can't yet is a whole different thing. There are things that I can't do that I want to do, but I can't do them yet. Now, at the same time, we can go way too far, right? I don't, I'm not going to be an Olympic pole vaulter, I'm not, and I'm not going to say I can't be an Olympic pole vaulter yet, right? I can't be an Olympic pole vaulter. So just, just don't fool yourself. You, you got to stretch yourself a little bit. So if you want to go back to the exercise analogy, everyone can become more fit. Everyone can become a better swimmer, but not everyone can become Michael Phelps, right? So is he still popular enough to talk about everyone? Else? Okay, good. So um, the, it changes. I don't know who the new example would be. All right, so is it worth it? I mean, I, I, could, we could, we, I don't want to talk a lot about data and studies today, but it is worth it. Every time they study, they, they, they show this. They show, they show very similar things. Here, I'll just give you an example of the research. They, they give people tests. They have them practice things like retrieval practice and space practice. What they actually found is when they test students all the time, and this is not the high stakes testing that people don't like, standardized testing. I'm talking about retrieval practice. When they force students to recall what they know, maybe it's just brain dumps where just, you know, write down everything you know about this topic. Or maybe it's just you read an article and then, or read a section of your book and close it. What do I remember for the information? When you do those kind of things, students are not going to do as good while they're studying. They're never going to reach like perfect fluency. They're never going to be like, I recognize all this material because their goal isn't to recognize it, it's to learn it. So they're going to look at they're doing worse. That's, that's the thing that stuck with me the most with the scientific research is the students that are using these things are doing worse until when? Until it's actually time to see who knows things instead of who recognizes things. Then they blow them out of the water. So you, when you're practicing retrieval practice, every day is going to be harder. You're not going to remember everything. Every day is going to be more of a struggle except the test day when you actually have to see what is in your memory banks. What is actually in your memory, they will do un unbelievably better. So you won't learn as much, right? So you won't, you won't get as high, but you won't come crashing down either. So you'll start a little bit lower. You'll have learned less today or recognized less today than, than you would if you did passive learning, but you won't, you won't, you'll barely forget it. 
So the amount you re can recall, the amount that's actually part of your long-term storage now is, is solidified and it's much, much better. So I'd rather you remember 30% of what I teach you forever than 90% for 16 weeks. F firm believer in that. I, I tell my anatomy students, if you remember 30% of what I teach you, you succeeded. There are students that can get 90% on their exams, but they, then we take a final exam and it's like, we used, to, uh, um, we used to use this Human Anatomy and Physiology Society exam, the standardized test. The average score was in the 30s. So students that were doing really well on tests that they could cram for, their grades, their, their scores were plummeting. So, they, so even the students that are getting 90% of the exams clearly aren't remembering 90%. So I would rather you remember, see my job is to be a filter. If you're only gonna remember 30%, my job is to point you towards the 30% of material that's the most important. And, and that's, that's what I feel like my primary job is. So is 30% enough? No, you know, like, you know, when I, before I went to graduate school, I took anatomy in high school, I took anatomy here. I've, ta I've, I've taken undergraduate anatomy and physiology classes five times. I took a gross anatomy class with a, with a cadaver for a year and a half. And then, I, and then I took two or more semesters on every organ system, which means I spent a year learning about, so like the skin, then I spent a year learning about whatever. So what I teach students in a week, I spent a year learning. So no, it's not enough. It, it, it's not enough for you to only know 30% of what's in an anatomy class, but to actually know 30% when you head into nursing or wherever you're going next is a huge step up from cramming to learn stuff and keeping in your short-term memory, your working memory, and then flushing it out. So yeah, 30% is a, is a victory in, in my opinion in, in some courses. So how do you do it? Close your books. How, how many times and how many ways can you test yourself? Flashcards, I just grabbed some of these, they don't all have pictures on them, but with a flashcard, I love flashcards because you can't see the answer. So you ha you have to, you're gonna test yourself, but here's the biggest mistake students make a flashcard. This is, this is actually someone's butt, but let's pretend there's words. Uh, so I just grabbed a stack of them, I'm, I was too lazy to make my own. So here's the question, I flip it over, oh yeah, I knew that answer. What did I do wrong? I recognized the answer, I didn't actually prove that I knew it. So read a question on a flashcard here. I brought some from Dr. Dreadful's Scabs and Guts at home, a gaming place. So let's see here. So what makes your feet smell? Old socks, garlic, or bacteria? So if I flipped it over and see it says, oh yeah, I knew it was bacteria. And you might, yeah. So no, I, I recognize that it's bacteria. I need to say out loud, I don't care if people think you're crazy talking to yourself, say bacteria and flip it over. So you have to test yourself, whether it's flashcards. Um, I recommend students, uh, so I actually have a list of things here to do, but um, so like these, these idea of brain dumping. So when you go home, tell people what you learned today. That's a great way to retrieve information. My peop, uh, the family of my students either love me or hate me because they feel like they've taken my classes because my students are hopefully going home and telling them what they're learning. So, if you, so teach someone what you're learning. That's a good way to practice retrieving information. Brain dumps where you write everything down, that's a good, good way to do it as well. Um, so you need, you need to, um, after you read something, close the book, what did it just teach me? What's the big picture of what I just read? If you watch a video, pause the video, do the same thing. Um, with, whether it's, so flashcards, another thing with flashcards is you wanna make sure that you, you, there's a couple things you can do with flashcards. You should shuffle them. If you're, if you're using flashcards, which I do think are a valuable tool, you should not do them in the same order because your brain can start to recognize them based on the order they're in. So you should be shuffling flashcards. Make sure you actually answer the question out loud before you look at the answer. Give yourself time to actually recall the information to interrupt that forgetting curve. Um, look at both sides of the flashcard. That's real smart too. So if, you, if you're studying, whatever you're studying, so uh, let's see, uh, mental, mental or mentis means chin. So I could say, okay, this says chin, the answer is mentis, turn it over, I was right. Reshuffle them up, later on, I see mentis, and I have to remember that means chin. So I think using both sides of flashcards is really smart, shuffling them is really smart, making sure you actually say the answer out loud is really smart. You can do this without flashcards, um, but I, just, I think they're a nice, easy tool, because what doesn't work is your textbook, because you can see everything. So now if you, can, if you can cover up the words around a picture in a textbook and explain what it means, that might be a way to do it. The key is, can you answer questions with as few cues as possible? Preferably none, no cues, no hints as to what the answer is. Can you actually recall the information? So um, practice exams, if you can't find them, you make them. Like you can find other people's flashcards on the internet. There's Quizlet and Anki and all these different, these different services. 
Find flashcards or make flashcards. Find practice quizzes or make practice quizzes. So uh, what else? So filling in the blanks. I, I had mentioned that earlier about how one thing I like about the, the notes at church is that they're filling the blank because you have to pay more attention. I have to be engaged because I don't know what words are going to go there. So I, I like how that, that has me pay better attention. So you can take like your lecture notes and remove some of the words or cover them, uh, and you can try to fill in the blanks. Um, multiple copies of assignments and reviews. I'm big on that. I tell students that if I give you a written assignment or a test review, you should be making 10 copies of it. I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm all for trees, but like I'm much more, you know, we can plant more trees. I, I only have 16 weeks to teach you how to learn So for my students. So, like, um, so if I give you a test review, and you go through all the work of answering all the questions you can, finding the answers you don't know, and you have it all there, and then you highlight it, and you have this beautiful document, and you're going through it. Oh, yeah, I know that. Oh, yeah, I know that. See that? You're just recognizing what's on the review. You should be starting with a blank test review every time. Fill it out as best you can, then go figure out what you don't know and why you don't know it. These are, these are simple. These, are the thing, these text are, techniques are simple. You might be wondering, why don't students do this? Because why? It's hard, and we don't like things that are hard. This is way harder than just rereading the same, uh, same uh, chapter in the textbook, same test review. It's way harder to do this. That's why students don't do it, but it works so well. So let's see, back to like the, the test reviews and, and refilling them out. Uh, uh, any, anything you can do where you're starting with a, a blank slate and seeing what you can recall is going to help. It's gonna interrupt the forgetting curve. It's gonna, it's gonna make those, the, the neural connections so much more solid than they'll ever be just from recognizing things. So uh, th that's like the best advice I can give you is to start from scratch whenever possible. So that's what a brain dump is. This is that, there's another name for it called the Feynman technique where you just sit down and you try to explain everything you know about a topic. Even if it's a physical topic, write out what are all the skills involved in this topic. You can do this with mental or physical things, but if you can do that, it's very important to see what you know and know what you don't know. That's why I tell students with their test reviews and these kind of things, answer everything you can, but what's really important then is figure out why you don't, what, what you don't know. So if you, if you do a brain dump where you just try to explain everything you know about a topic to somebody, then go back to your notes, go back to your textbook, et cetera. What should I have known that I don't? That's where you should study. It's, it's almost like an analog version of this adaptive learning. All this cool high-tech stuff where textbooks can now ask you questions and tell you what you still don't know. That's really powerful stuff. It's called adaptive learning. But you can do it yourself. So like here's a whole page in the textbook that I didn't know anything about. At least I didn't, didn't recall anything about it. So um, that's what a brain dump is.